Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to our services here. Welcome those that are watching us on Facebook Live this morning or those who will be watching the service later recorded. It's good to have you all with us this morning. We are here to praise and worship Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior, God our Father. Before we do, just a couple of announcements. So Larry's just reminding me. The time changed everywhere else in the world, but it didn't here this morning. Unless you had your phone on a California cell tower, um, but if you're here, you must not have because you're here on time this morning. Um, uh, the uh, men's Monday night um, uh, football will now be an hour later. It'll be at 6.15 because the rest of the country did change. In your bulletins this morning, you will find a blue prayer request card. On November the 11th, for 11 hours, our sanctuary will be open and prayer will be going on for those 11 hours here. If you have prayer requests that you wish to share, you can fill out this card and leave it here this morning. You can go to our website online and you can leave your prayer request. It's a good opportunity to take some of these and give out to friends and neighbors who may have prayer requests and tell them it will be prayed for. These can be anonymous or if they would like to have these returned to them with those who've prayed for them on the card, they can give us their name and address and we will send those back. A very important ministry that we have been uh, utilizing since Pastor Katie came to spend those 11 hours praying for our world, for our country, for our city, for our church, and for special needs that are presented to us. Prayer is important. It does. My wife says this all the time. She says, you know, prayer changes things. And so be a part of that. Fill out a card. Give out some cards to friends. Or go to our website and leave your prayer request. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Would you stand with us? We want to begin by singing Amazing Grace. Oh! 
Apostles' Creed set to music. This I believe.
I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. And thank you. You may be seated. We're going to prepare for the offering at this time. I'm going to give Sharon a moment to uh, move over to the piano. Uh, and um, she's going to share with us an offertory this morning that we always look forward to. God is good. <coughs> he has blessed us. Uh, he, has well, he has required a very little of us in return. But what he has required, we give back to him. And even more as our praise and a gift back to him for his goodness to us. Let's pray for the offering this morning. Father God, you are a blessing to us. We are your children and we honor you by returning to you the gifts you have required and the praise gifts that you have not required, just our joy in giving back to you. So bless this offering. Use it to your kingdom's good, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Sharon. The last line of that said, His blood can cleanse your heart, and you will see. T'was best to let him have his way with thee. Thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful song. Over the next two songs that we're going to sing together this morning, we're preparing for communion today, which Ka Pastor Katie will be sharing with us in just a little while. But would you stand with us? And we begin by singing the table. We are all invited to the table of the Lord this morning. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I won't hunger anymore at his table. at the 
table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Bye. 
Got to turn myself on and get ready and go. It is a blessing to be here. Happy November. I'm Pastor Katie, and we're going to continue our time of worship with communion. And as you know, it's always a special day when we come together to share in the Lord's Supper together. In the Nazarene Church, you don't have to be a member in order to participate in communion. Although I do want to tell you that we have a membership class coming up. And so put that in your memory banks. I don't remember the date. But um, if you're interested in uh, becoming a member, please text me or fill out one of our communication cards, connection cards on the seat backs, or message me online and Facebook or any way you can get a hold of me. Uh, we would love for you to join the membership of our church uh, if you are not already. And the class itself isn't just so we can get members. That's not the goal. The goal is, is that everybody who attends our church would understand what our core beliefs are. And if you sang along with the Creed song this morning, you learned what those core beliefs are. Uh, and I would like you to know a little bit about what our plans are here in the local church. And maybe you have some specific questions, uh, things like communion or baptism or things that, um, that we celebrate as a part of our denomination and this church. So 
uh, please let me know if you are not a member um, and would like to attend um, some time together. We might just um, have a small meal here. We might uh, find a place to go have coffee safe from COVID or something, but uh, it would depend on who's coming uh, and how many, rather. So let's continue with communion. The Lord himself ordained uh, this special and holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples on that night that he was betrayed to partake in the bread and the wine emblems of his broken body. He commands us to do this in remembrance of him. But it's not just to remember Jesus, the man who walked on earth. It's to remember that Jesus died for you and you and you. He's saying, look, don't forget me and what I've done. Don't forget my heavenly Father, me, the Holy Spirit, triune God. Don't forget us because we want you to become a part of the family of God for all eternity. I want you to remember not just so you're, you're good today. I want you to remember because I want to have a relationship with you forever. I want to see you on the other side of the pearly gates and offer you all that I am preparing for you. I want you to remember that it was not a small price. Jesus knew even as he spoke to his disciples that suffering was to come. And he suffered. There was a big price for our sin. But it was paid in completion. We don't need to work to earn our way into heaven. There's not enough work we could do. We don't need to work in order to be in God's favor. God already loves you. But we do need to have faith that on that moment that he died on the cross and his blood was shed, it covered our sins. And we do need to have faith that it was Jesus Christ who walked out of the grave and conquered death for all time. It's very important you see that the death was not the end and the resurrection was not the end. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's not the end either because we are eternal. God is eternal forever. Infinity, we get to go to heaven forever and we get to celebrate communion at the Lord's Supper in heaven. And between now and then, we continue to come into a relationship with God and share in the elements of communion on a regular basis so that we will not forget who God is, what God has done out of love for us, and the eternal hope that we have in heaven. So I the, want to pray. We don't have to be a member of the Nazarene Church, but Scripture is very clear. We do need to have a right relationship with God. So if there's some sin in your life, just pass by. Don't, you don't have, they're on your seats, actually, or if you're at home. Hold off on having communion until you get right with God. If there's someone you need to forgive, forgive them today. If there's someone you need to seek forgiveness for, do it today. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, now's a good time, right? And, and we'll be talking about that more a little bit later. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done for us. We praise you for that. We're excited to be a part of your family. We're excited to participate in the sacrament that you set aside for us. Because we want to remember that you loved us so much that you died for us. We want to remember that we needed that because we were sinful or are sinful if we have not uh, set those sins aside and allowed you to change us. Lord, I place my faith in you and I trust that you have forgiven my sins. And I lean into you and into my relationship with you, seeking your help and the infilling of your spirit. Lord, I praise you for all that you are. I worship you. And I thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, bless our time together. Bless this holy meal that we share together. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So if you haven't been with us since we've been using the self-contained communion cups, there's a fine film on top that you will need to pull back in order to um, get the uh, bread. And then a second film to get to the juice. And I know it's hard. You might need to wiggle that or get some assistance there. Scripture reminds us that on the same night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Eat this and be grateful. In the same way, after supper, after he had given thanks, he took the cup and he gave it to them, saying, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was poured out for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Drink this and be grateful. Amen. Jesus Messiah, name above all. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Lloyd, and thank you to our worship team. It is nice to be in the house of the Lord, and we are blessed by today, not a technological issue yet, <laughs> that I knew about anyways, and uh, so we're blessed by that as well. We are starting a new sermon series. Uh, in spite of what it says on the top of your notes, it's called Be Grateful, short and simple. I uh, hated to leave the last series, but I'm happy to be in the new one. So uh, we might touch back on fighting your fears in the future. Just this last week, I, I had one of the most terrifying news articles I'd read in a long time that wasn't about uh, our political system. <laughs> I read that um, there was a murder hornet's nest that was removed in Washington, from Washington. These Asian giant hornets have found their way to America. Now, three or four of them can take out an entire hive of honeybees in a couple of hours. They just keep stinging and stinging. So the murder hornets eat killer bees for lunch. Tell me that I'm not terrified. Hopefully, they got them all, but they don't think so. They didn't find the queen. So I pray for the queen. <laughs> Let her die peacefully. <laughs> Anyways, we're, we're grateful for the 82 or something murder hornets they removed from safe and sound. Today. Um, oh, interesting. I, my notes are out of order. Uh, <laughs> so much for technology. Paper and pencil can do you wrong as well. Um, we're going to be studying for the next four weeks uh, the book of Malachi. 
And then we go right from Malachi of the Old Testament, of course, to the Advent series. So that's on purpose because this was the last little bit that the Israelites had for 400 years before the coming of Christ. So I thought, well, we'll study Malachi, and then we'll wait a week, <laughs> which is enough, right? And we'll come back and begin to talk about the coming of Christ. The book of Mal Malachi uh, is written by Malachi. Uh, we don't really know if that's his real name because the name Malachi means messenger. So it's kind of like the book secretary or the book, you know, announcer. But it might have been his name. He might have been called Malachi. Uh, I didn't... Um, go into it too deeply, but that was what one commentator said, so I thought that was interesting. Malachi, we'll call him that, comes across as a sensitive pastor, a wise theologian, and a very stern prophet, and I find myself liking the guy, but I'm glad that I did not have the task to do that he had to do. His audience was the Jews, what was left of them, they're in the Persian province of Judea. Scholars date the prophecy at about 430 B.C. So it's at this time that the Jews are still coming back from Babylon to Judah. The temple had been uh, rebuilt, but it really wasn't as fancy as Solomon's temple, but it was a temple. There had been a little bit of revival with Ezra and with the coming back and the excitement and the rebuilding of the, the temple and the rebuilding of the walls. But now things, uh, you know, a little time had gone by, so things were fizzling on that front. In fact, temple worship was in a sad state of affairs. The priests were no longer living lives of holiness. They had actually lost their fervor. And we see that they lead the people into sin. They allow it. They condone it. They participate in it. The requirements for the animal sacrifices and the offerings were neglected, as were other elements of worship. Things were getting worse and worse. The very fact that this is the last prophet should tell you some things, because every prophet was kind of saying the same things. Come back to God. Come back to God. And the people are like, Ugh, and they come back a little bit. Ugh. Well, now this is the last one. And then silence, radio silence, 400 years. So things were a bit disarray as far as the temple and worship and animal sacrifices. The people seemed lost. Maybe it was because their expectations for the king out of the David line hadn't been met yet. Where is he? Where's this king? All this time has gone by. Not that any of us ever feel like that. When's he coming back? <laughs> Please stand for the reading of Malachi chapter 1. We won't read all of it, but most of it. Starting with verse 1. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. I have always loved you, says the Lord. But you retort, really? How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor Jacob, but I rejected his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. Esau's descendants in Edom may say, we've been sh shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of heaven's army replies, they may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the land of wickedness, and their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. When you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. Verse 6, the Lord of heaven's army says to the priests, a son honors his father, and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you say, 
How have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to the governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Down to verse 12. But you dishonor my name with your actions. By bringing contemptible food, you're saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say, well, it's too hard to serve the Lord, and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. You may be seated. Regarding the Jews in Malachi's day, pastor and author Christian Chung writes, life hasn't been easy. The promises that God has spoken through Haggai and Zechariah more than a generation ago, were far from being fulfilled. The Jews were still living under the Persian rule. Life was tough, and the people were facing insect plagues and poor harvest. In their hardship, the people doubted God's love and what he has said. The glorious future was too far away to be real. Distrust sets in, and we see the people questioning God. So Malachi is writing this oracle or message in kind of a truth and rebuttal format, like one would see in a courtroom or trial. That word oracle, it actually can mean burden. It's a heavy load that he's carrying. And it is heavy because we see the result of whatever they were feeling or whatever their attitude is or however they were slipping back in their faith, the result is disobedience in a wrong relationship between them and their heavenly father. They didn't feel loved. They thought things were just too hard to serve the Lord. And the result was disobedience and ultimately separation from God. The sins outlined in this chapter and in the rest of the book, they're numerous. I mean, they're numerous, and it's heavy. However, I want to start where God started. Verse 2, it says, I have always loved you, says the Lord. I have always loved you. I have always loved you. God's message is the same for us today. God loves you and wants more than anything to be in a forever, everlasting relationship with you. Faith, obedience, that's it. As long as we continue to believe in God, we get to be in a forever, everlasting relationship with God. I'm not so sure, like as long as any of us live in our, these bodies on this side of heaven, and maybe even in heaven, I'm not so sure we can ever fully or adequately comprehend God's love for us. When it says God has always loved us. Can we comprehend that? I do believe if we just understood this much of God's love for us, we would never, ever, ever sin. We just wouldn't do it. We would be so overwhelmed that someone could love us that much the way God loves us that we would do everything we could do to please God back. You want to be in a relationship with me? I'm yours. Nothing else matters. We would understand nothing else matters but that relationship with God and how we can then please our Heavenly Father, loving others, serving others, serving God, worshiping God, and being grateful for anything that we have, let alone everything that we have here. We can't comprehend it. 
Maybe our guilt gets in the way, our humanness, our little teeny itty bitty brains get in the way. They can't get it. I like how David writes in Psalm 13. He goes through this progression. He starts off kind of being brutally honest about his very temporary circumstances. And he writes in verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How, or I'm sorry, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? God could see David. God wasn't hiding from David. He goes down to verse 5. And David recognizes in spite of his experience, what he thinks right then and there he knows. But I trust in your unfailing love. It's like, even though I don't understand everything, even though I'm suffering right now, even though it feels like the whole world is against me, and maybe it was, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. And we need to keep coming back to that. No matter how much suffering, no matter what happens November 3rd, no matter when the Lord comes back or doesn't come back, we will praise God. We will seek to understand God's love by being in that relationship with God every single moment of our lives. We will live out that love here and on earth and praise God for it. Pastor Leroy Redding helped inform my thoughts in this next section. Here he points out that Malachi is really a love letter from God, that it's full of hope and encouragement. So I had to kind of reword it with that in mind. Keep going back to verse 2. I have always loved you. Malachi's mandate was to call the people back to this vibrant relationship with the living Lord. Their problem Maybe part ignorance, but more indifference. When they started feeling sorry for themselves, when they started questioning God's love, they're questioning who God is. And that impacts their faith as it goes on. Yet God begins and ends with his love for them. I have always loved you. It's not, oh, you're so guilty. You're so funny looking. Oh, you, you were bad. It's like, nope. It's about love. It's about the relationship. In his book called The Sacred Romance, John Eldridge writes, God is courting us. As he pursues us with his love and calls us to a journey full of intimacy, adventure, and beauty. To ignore his whispered call is to become one of the living dead who carry on their lives, divorced from their heart. That's not God's best for us. Our relationship with God ought to be exciting. It brings us pleasure and joy. It ought to be one of peace and hope. It's different than what the rest of the world is carrying. The burden is sin. God is all other things but sin. The, the good in life, the wonderful in life, that's coming from God. Every single blessing is from above. That's for us. God's love is the essence of who God is. And you need to keep going back to that. You start thinking, ah, I believe in God, but I don't know that he loves me. That's impossible. God is love. You can't have one without the other. Your relationship with God is because God loved you. God's love is the essence of what he is. And in this love, of course, it's all-powerful. It's personal. It's sovereign. It's eternal. It's amazing. It's unconditional on how good or bad you think you might be. It is perfect love. Love, an active verb. God is always going out of his way to shower you with his love, to cover you with his grace, to cover you with his mercy. The love is as powerful as God because God is love. It's moving and serving and proving over and over and over again who God is. Open your eyes if you don't think God loves you because God's arms are wrapped around you as you even ask the question. God is there and available. I think 1 John 4, 7 uh, through 10, 12, the whole chapter is good, but we'll say 7 through 10 really helps us to see it one more time in Scripture. Love comes from God. 
Anyone who loves is a child of God. This is the New Living Translation. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us. How? By sending his son, his only son, into the world so that How did the Israelites, why would the Israelites choose to live in darkness? What is it that they were missing? Like John, uh, Malachi emphasizes that when we, that we do not reflect God's love in our worship, or if we don't, they didn't. If we don't reflect it in our worship, then we do not know God. It would, we would have to reflect in our worship our love of God if we understood who God is. It's worship and obedience that we would want to offer if we knew God. And God's spirit helps us and pushes us and promotes us to do that. The fact that they had turned away from God resulted in their wrong attitude and their wrong worship. They lacked faith, placent, and they became flat out disobedient. They knew the law. They knew what was required of them, and yet they whined. Mm, it's too hard. Mm, if you loved us, well, it wouldn't be this hard. Our life would be easier. Now, where did they get that idea? Please don't get that idea from me. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm just telling you right now, life does not necessarily get easier. You have more peace. You have more hope. You have more happiness. You have more joy. You have more love. You have more purpose. You have a whole lot of things. You have an abundant life of these things, and you have all of the promises of God, which are too great and many to, to identify right now, but they're all good. <laughs> you get them all. But life on this earth and these bodies, is never going to be completely easy, you know? So you celebrate the joys and the blessings you do have, and you lean on God all the more and build your faith with the challenges you have. They go together. God knows how weak we are. When everything's going good, we just might forget to mention how much we love God. When do you hit your knees? The moment something goes wrong. God knows that. And I think maybe he wants us to hit our knees a lot these days. <laughs> Certainly around murder hornets. Or <laughs> the Israelites' lack of faith and their disobedience was keeping them from God's blessings. Do you catch that? There are more blessings as we are obedient. For example, we tell someone about Jesus and they become a believer do you not think that is a blessing? And then they come alongside of you and you're serving together? That's a blessing. And there's so many of them. We get blessed as we carry out God's will in our life. When we're living out the purpose in which we have been created, using our gifts and talents, there are blessings in that. There's joy in that. And there's much to be grateful for. Malachi reminds the Israelites of their history Back to when God chose Jacob and not Esau. And you thought I wasn't going to get to your note. <laughs> God had made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and then with Isaac and Jacob, all the way down through the Israelites. God wanted to bless and save the entire world through the Israelites. But they were disobedient. They turned away from God. So, and Paul tells us about this more, but and I, I want to point out that in verse 3, some of the, your versions say that God uh, chose or elected Jacob, loved Jacob, but hated Esau. I think the New Living Translation has a better translation there where it says he rejects Esau. But don't stumble over that either way. Some say it's a writing technique, you know, when you compare, he 
he loves and he hates, you know, or the hate is relative to how much he loves Jacob. He chooses Jacob. That's God's prerogative to choose who God would choose. But the eternal rewards are based on how much, if we have faith. The eternal rewards, rewards are for those who choose to place their faith in Jesus Christ. That includes the Israelites and the Gentiles now. See, when the Jews failed to have faith in God, Paul compares them to an olive tree where that branch, those who walked away, was broken off, which provided room then, so to speak, for the Gentiles, which is anyone who's not Jewish, so everyone else, to be grafted back in to the olive tree. It made a place for us. We've been grafted in and now receive the same inheritance as promised to Israel. And then 11.23 says that the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to do that. Once you place your faith in God, you're in. You're in. Grafted into the tree, brought into a right relationship with God, promised eternal life. There's a place waiting for you at the table. God's mercy is for everyone. God saves those who believe in the Lord, but God wants everyone to come to him. So in your notes, God chose, chose the descendants of Jacob and not Esau. And just a little reminder about these two brothers, sons of Isaac. Jacob, yes, a deceiver, but he grew to trust God. Esau despised his birthright and rejects the covenant relationship with God. I believe God knew that when he chose Jacob. He knew Jacob's heart. I believe God knows our heart too. When we choose to place our faith in God, we are promised eternity with him. Paul refers to God's choice in Romans 9. And I don't have time to go there now, but a great homework assignment for you. The verses remind us that even when we don't understand God's purposes and choices, we can know and trust that God is sovereign. God can do what God wants, right? It's not up for us, it's not up to us to know or to tell God what to do. God's purposes are, are a reflection of God's love, who God is. They're coming from a place of love. And God's compassion for humankind. God wants all to be saved. And God's sense of justice. Knowing again sins and what we've done wrong. God wants to cover those sins with the blood of Jesus. But people who reject Jesus cannot have their sins forgiven. So God chose to start with the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then opened it up to the Gentiles. Under the new covenant, we're given an opportunity to receive this free gift of salvation. It's connected with the new covenant that came, and we celebrated that here today. It was ratified with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that all who believe can share the inheritance of Christ. So in your notes, we've got God chose the descendants of Jacob, not Esau, and God's love was demonstrated with an eternal covenant for us, for all who believe. An everlasting covenant. Again, God wants to spend forever with his children. And just so you hear it again and see it again, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, everybody, that he gave his one and only son that whoever anybody believes in him shall not perish perish but have everlasting life so in your notes god loves all people brown and yellow black and white 
and offers salvation to all who believe. And what one believes about God is reflected in our attitude and actions. So we turn back to Malachi. Verse 6 through 10 talk about their sins, but starting with verse 6, children, honor your parents, servants, respect their masters. This we understand. No one would disagree. But where is the honor and the respect due to me? See, we heard and we read that there was contempt of God in their heart. It was shown in their actions and the sacrifices that they brought. And again, starting with the leadership on down. We here, if you've got someone watching you, you're a leader. You are an example of the walk of Jesus Christ in other people's lives. They're looking at you. We will be held accountable. Their sacrifices were a disgrace. Their leadership was a disgrace. This bringing of defiled and sick and crippled animals, diseased, those are the leftovers. You know they're saving the best for themselves. In their selfish actions, it's a reflection that they think that they're better than their God. They love themselves more than they love God because they question God's love for them. That was a lack of faith. You catch that, right? They wanted everything in their timing, and when they didn't get things when they wanted it, how they wanted it, the way it, they thought it should come, their faith wavered, and they ended up disobeying God. The people responded to God's love with contempt, dishonored God, and were complacent in their worship of God. They brought unworthy sacrifices, disobedience, and they had a lack of heartfelt adoration. Their worship was not worship of God. It was anything but. Because when we worship and praise God, it needs to come first from a place of faith in God. And we can't have faith in any God, not like an idol. We need to have faith in our God, whose essence is love. We need to understand by faith God's great love for us. And of course, for your notes, the priest failed in their example of their faith in failed as spiritual examples, and the house was crumbling. It's one thing to have doubts here and there, to question scripture, to wonder about why this church is different than that church, even to goof up sometimes. But here, it was a disregard for the law. They knew what was required of them. They were to bring an unblemished animal to the Lord. So the question's for us. We know what is required of us. And I'm referring here to tithes and offerings. Tithes being a tenth of what we have uh, received off the top. Offerings, well, what offerings are required of us? Good news is scripture's clear on this. <laughs> God tells us. He wants us. He wants our hearts. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that God wants us to be completely surrender our lives to God. He wants all of us. So first we begin with faith. God wants to have a relationship with us, to place our faith in Jesus Christ. And then we move to surrender. Okay, great, you know who Jesus is, you have faith in Jesus Christ, but God wants us to surrender our entire lives. Not just to be thinking about who God is and, yeah, yeah, got that, check. No, God wants us to live out our lives as if God is the number one most important thing all of the time. God requires of us to say yes before he ever asks. And when we understand how much God loves us, that becomes a very easy thing to do. And fortunately, God's spirit is in us and helps us to live obediently and in love back with God. The response, which comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, is one of gratitude and of praise and of ador adoration and of worship. God wants to hear your praises. 
Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. After telling us what God has done for us, it says, Therefore, let us offer, this is your offering, through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. So our lives are our living testimony, our living sacrifice of who uh, God is and our relationship to God. Our sacrifice of praise pleases God, worshiping God and giving him the adoration that he deserves. In your notes, there's some questions for you to consider. There is always a next step spiritually until God takes us home. So again, re reflect on what do you need to do in order to take your next spiritual step forward. If you're praising God life, <laughs> your life of gratitude and thanksgiving isn't up to par, then this is the time to really work on that. Maybe read through the Psalms every day in November. Keep a, a gratitude journal or add that to your regular journal. If you spend an hour on social media, maybe cut it down to half and spend a half an hour praising God. Prayers and petitions. Plan to join us on 1111 as we worship and praise God and give God our prayers and petitions. Consider your next step. Ask God to show you. Maybe it's membership or baptism. But commit to really stepping out and telling God that you love God back. Continue to stay in the word so you are reminded over and over again who God is and the love that God had for you when he sent Jesus to die for your sins. Let's praise God in our prayers this morning. Thank you, Lord for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here and giving us life. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you did on the cross for each of us who believes in you. Lord, I pray for any who need to take that next step of salvation, that they would tell you that they believe and that they would mean it in their hearts, that they would turn from their sins and receive your free gift of eternal life. Lord, I pray for those who are maybe holding back. They know that you are the Savior of the world, but they think maybe there's areas in their lives they can manage better than you. Lord, we turn every area of our life over to you. We ask that you would examine it and show us what it is that we can offer to you more. Where is it that you need us to release our own will and receive your will? Help us to be accountable to you. I pray that we can't sleep if there's something in the way of our perfect relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, help each of us to continue to be full of gratitude this month and always, especially for your love, but also for the many, many blessings you have showered upon us. We praise you for those. We thank you for those. We love you, Lord. Amen. challenged every week by the messages pastor brings to us and i hope that you are too would you stand with us <clears throat> we're going to close uh, with who you say i am and then you'll remain standing for the closing scripture this morning if you would who am i i am who god says i am i am a child forgiven and set free That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. 
at last he has ransomed me oh his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the son says free oh is free indeed i'm a child of god yes i am in my father's house there's a place for me i'm a child of god yes i am i am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun says free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Our closing scripture is from Psalms 103, 1 through 2. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Have a fantastic week. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Who the sun sets free, oh is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am.